Hi everyone, welcome to the Platform Services Roadmap for OpenShift. I'm Rob Sumsky, I'm a Product Manager at Red Hat, and I'm joined by my colleagues William and Siamak. Today we're going to be talking about the Platform Services Roadmap for OpenShift, but before we begin, I just want to talk about uh, OpenShift 4 in general for a few seconds to set some context. With OpenShift 4, we reimagined what a cloud-native Kubernetes tech stack looks like from how it's installed, bringing things like immutable infrastructure into the mix, and adding operators to manage the entire state of the cluster, like a team of operations superheroes. Starting with this theme of automation and day two management top of mind means that the cluster is really smart. It's actually extremely smart. It can upgrade over the air, it can react to its own state if it's degraded, as well as gain proactive patches for problems that other Red Hat customers are seeing before you've even hit them on your own cluster. All that automation keeps pushing innovation up into the tools that your developers are using, when you've got a really stable, really dynamic cluster, you can make it really easy for cluster admins to push up a stream of updates for things like service mesh, pipelines and serverless, new versions of Kubernetes, uh, gaining all the innovation that happens in that upstream community. That innovation is baked into every layer of OpenShift and it forms a holistic platform for running your hybrid cloud. Now today we're gonna to focus on these blue boxes, um, the cluster services that enable your development teams to write code, ship software and manage their application stacks but other sessions covered the other boxes in great detail, so check those out on the agenda. Now, when we talk about the application stack, um, we mean one that's born in a cloud-native world. Tools like Istio, Knative, and Tekton empower your applications to take advantage of the new automation that the infrastructure can provide. And producing apps that are supercharged in this new paradigm does require new tools like Eclipse, Che, Quarkus, and the operator framework. Super excited to see what you build, so let's dive in and see how this stack is the perfect match for OpenShift. Now, platform services are some of the key value adds to the platform, uh, and what this does is tie uh, these features into your workloads uh, so that they have the unique capabilities that the platform provides. Um, so things like we talked about earlier, service mesh, pipelines, and serverless, as well as other capabilities like doing uh, usage tracking and chargeback across the platform, as well as have all of your applications uh, grant access to our full stack of the logging infrastructure. So we're gonna dig into each one of these in a little bit more detail. Tracking usage across a cluster is important for every business, but especially in multi-tenant clusters. OpenShift's metering operator allows for cluster administrators to schedule reports and track usage for CPU, RAM, and other metrics as your developers are consuming resources inside of their namespaces. Once it's installed from Operator Hub, new chargeback screens will appear in your console, giving you the ability to look at the reports you have scheduled, schedule new ones, create custom reports, and even query those via a live API. What's exciting about metering is it's just a really great piece of technology as a general usage collector, and it's very unopinionated about how that data is used. This makes it perfect for plugging it into business intelligence tools that your company might run, or other specific workflows that impact how your business units and your teams are set up. Uh, you can use metering as the data source to power those workflows. At Red Hat, we also use metering as an opinionated usage collector for two of our products, Red Hat Cost Management and the Red Hat Marketplace. Let's dig into both in more detail. The Red Hat Cost Management tool combines IaaS usage data with Red Hat subscription usage to give your company visibility into your spend and map that spend to different teams and projects that are underway. This is a hosted service that works across multiple clusters and multiple clouds, bringing you that true hybrid capability. A really cool feature of this is to track persistent volume usage across OpenShift, which can really sneak up on you, especially when you have a ton of users on all of your clusters. Um, this can really add up, especially if you're using and storing data that you don't really need to keep around. And the Red Hat Marketplace allows enterprises to curate software that teams have access to, and when you in negotiate enterprise-wide purchase agreements, um, you can track all of that in one place. Now, just like class management, the Red Hat Marketplace can track this across clusters, um, giving your developers a single location to find certified software that can then be installed across all or some of your OpenShift clusters. Procurement teams also can simplify approvals, track application usage from cluster to cluster or team to team to make sure that that usage remains within their desired levels. Operators remain very popular with OpenShift users, and this year we'll bring enhancements to the experience of building operators and managing operators as an administrator. The first big improvement is unifying the object model into a single operator object, which will help users of the cluster discover operators, but also aid developers in testing them, 
especially combined with our new ability to bundle custom functional tasks together. Also updated is a new simplified Simver based upgrade logic, which will join our more advanced update graph capabilities that exist today to match those really complex needs as well as very simplistic needs. Improving our tools for building customized catalogs and mirroring that content into offline environments is both useful for operator developers and cluster admins. This will make it easier for developers to test their upgrade paths and register in progress operator catalogs. Uh, you can picture it like a nightly catalog, for example. Cluster admins will very uh, easily be able to bundle specific versions of operators instead of grabbing the entire latest catalog. This change will be uh, great for um, improving mirror times into disconnected environments, as well as better curation overall. You want to get your developers just the sets of tools that you want them to. And lastly, we're very excited to bring the operator framework into the CNCF as a sandbox project. Um, we've been hard at work on this, and we're very excited to see um, more innovation and community engagement as we go with the CNCF's backing. With that, I'm going to hand it over. Thank you, Rob. Now let's talk about OpenShift Service Mesh. As some of you might already know, a service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for handling service-to-service -service communication. It is responsible for the reliable delivery of requests to a complex topology of services that usually comprise a modern cloud-native application. In practice, the service mesh is typically implemented as an array of lightweight network proxies that are deployed alongside an application code without the application needing to be aware often leveraging a pattern called sidecar containers. As we continue the development of OpenShift Service Mesh, we are increasing the flexibility of how our customers manage their systems and how we, as Red Hat, can aid with that. At the beginning of April, we released version 1.1 of OpenShift Service Mesh. This release is backwards compatible back to two versions of OpenShift. Through the operator managed install, we can introspect the cluster version and perform the correct steps to ensure you have a working system. In this newest release, we have a number of exciting things to talk about. We fixed a number of bugs regarding gRPC handling, which can improve how traces are captured and managed with Jaeger, and we have also improved how Kiali allows for traffic visualization. Here is an example of one of the new exciting features in Kiali, the ability to drill down into charts when you see something interesting to inspect. But beyond those high-level details, there are a number of aspects of Istio which are specifically exciting to talk about. For users who are allowing Citadel to fully provision and manage the Internal Certificate Authority for Mutual TLS, the setup is even more streamlined. Beyond that, we can also monitor and reconcile issues with expiration of the underlying root certificate. There are also a number of verbs that have been added to the Istio CTL or Istio Control tooling which can provide improvement for the troubleshooting of misconfigurations. In the context of traffic management, we have new items. The new authorization policy mechanism has now graduated to a beta status. While, of course, there are details to be worked out, this will move us towards a better granular control over how users can engage with services running in the mesh. Users of traffic mirroring, a very popular feature also called dark launches, we'll be excited to hear that now they can send a quantum of the traffic to a service rather than the whole copy of all the packets. This will provide developers and site administrators a way to test their code earlier and more often, leading to great service reliability. Finally, the implementation of a much more efficient regular expression engine has been completed within the proxy, which brings performance improvements, especially for complex checks. OpenShift Serverless. Serverless workloads are increasing in popularity for cloud and on-premise deployments. We have baked serverless capabilities into the platform with OpenShift Serverless that enables almost any containerized application to run as serverless. That means you can choose any programming language of choice and enable auto-scaling behavior, scaling up to meet the demand and scale down even to zero, saving resources. Beyond auto-scaling for HTTP requests, you can trigger those serverless containers from a variety of event sources and receive events such as Kafka messages, file uploads to storage, timers, recurring jobs, and more than 100 other event sources like Salesforce, ServiceNow, and email, all powered by CamelK. OpenShift Serverless is based on the open source project Knative, one of the fastest growing serverless projects in the market. 
This ensures that you don't suffer with lock-in concerns and can still get the innovation from a growing open source community. We're very happy to say that serverless now is GA, which means you can take it to production and run anywhere OpenShift runs, delivering a hybrid cloud experience and a hybrid serverless experience with portability and flexibility. Let's look at the serverless operational benefits. Without serverless containers, you eventually have to deal with one of these two problems. Over-provisioning, when you have too many containers running and IT has to eat the cost of running those idle resources. Or under-provisioning, when you have more requests than the number of provision containers, which essentially leads to a poor quality of service or even lost business revenue when you miss those critical transactions. With serverless containers though, the number of containers try to match your demand, as you can see in the picture here on the right. It saves time and cost on your IT department, creating a more direct line between IT costs and business revenue. The availability of more capacity in the system also helps you increase the density of your clusters, allowing customers to run more applications with the infrastructure they already have. The user experience of OpenShift Serverless is at the heart and center of OpenShift. On the console, you can visualize your serverless applications, the services that can trigger those containers, and set the traffic distribution for multiple versions of an application. The installation is done through an operator that enables a great day one experience and an even better day two, delivering over the air updates with bug fixes and CVEs that can be applied automatically. You can also leverage the CLI, KN, the official CLI of Knative, to create applications and even sources for those applications. With a single command, you get a service deployed and URL to access the service within a couple of seconds. The time seen here illustrate the creation of a service, a route, a deployment, and the download of the container image in the cluster, which is pretty fast. Thank you, William. The next piece I want to talk about is OpenShift Builds, uh, the next service in platform services. Uh, it's an API that allows you to build lean images from application source code and, and binary on Kubernetes itself. So you, you can create really slim images. Let's say you have a Java project, Java Maven project, and uh, you want to build this uh, Java application from source, but you don't want to, all the build tools to be included uh, within the, the resulting image, your runtime image. Your runtime image should be as slim as possible, including the minimal dependencies like Java runtime uh, environment and your application binary. So through this API, we can trim down and cut out all those dependencies and keep them limited to during the build time and produce images that are really lean. They only include dependencies that are required at the runtime. It also opens the uh, space for using any of the Kubernetes build tools uh, that, uh, that you're familiar with and are, are quite popular in the Kubernetes community. You might be using Builder for uh, doing Docker file builds or source to image if you want to automatically turn the source code into a binary image, cloud native build packs, uh, Canico, JIP, and, and other tools. So it provides a quite an extensible API with uh, uh, supporting build strategies that are available in the Kubernetes community. And at the same time, it's, it has a very pluggable architecture, so you can extend it to uh, more custom strategies that you might be using within your organization because you have a special needs. So a lot of our customers, uh, they, they create their own uh, strategies uh, because they are doing RPM build or they need to do uh, security signing and other aspects of build that are not part of the standard build through these build tools, but they can modify it and add their own uh, way of building their artifacts uh, within the same API and use it using the same tooling that OpenShift Build uh, provides. And, and most importantly, OpenShift Build is portable and can run on any Kubernetes a platform. Uh, it is based on CRD, so you would install the operator on any Kubernetes and it can consume the same API, run the same build, regardless of what kind of build tool uh, you're using. And OpenShift Builds, we have just recently started with this project. Uh, it's going to be developer preview on OpenShift 4.4, and we are rapidly iterating in the community on it to take it to GA, uh, hopefully within this year. How does OpenShift Build API work? Uh, this is a kind of a simplification of uh, the internals of OpenShift Build. So there is uh, there are a number of uh, CRs, custom resources that represent builds. There's build, build a strategy um, that uh, within the build, you specify what build a strategy should be used. You want to use source to image or cloud native build packs or Canico or something else. And that defines really 
the gist of how the actual build should be done. Uh, but you just choose a strategy. You don't have to go um, deal with all the details of how uh, build packs, for example, are used or how source to image is used. You provide your Git repo or application binary to the build API, and you also specify what kind of base image you want to use or and what kind of what image um, the build uh, that contains the build tool. The build strategy obviously comes with these uh, good values for this, right? So when you choose source to image, it knows, for, for Java, for example, it knows which image it should be used that contains all the build tools for your Java application and which base image is appropriate as your resulting image, right? So you, you take the JDK uh, image that contains Maven for the build tool image and you would continue, you pick a very slim JRE image for uh, your base image. Then uh, it builds the application, it uh, layers your application, if it's a jar, uh, Java example here, you probably have a jar file, it lays it over the base image that Jerry Slim produces the application image. You can as, as quite simply change the strategies if you want, go to a different strategy within the same API, you don't really have to uh, change much in the, in the API, it's just the one attribute changes. So what Bills does is really abstract in the way that you use uh, these build strategies, build tools, and, and runs them on Kubernetes and it provides a set of tooling you rather so through CLI and console over time you can interact with these builds. Uh, like I said, it's a, quite a beginning, but uh, it, it, we have already launched this project and hoping that throughout this year we're going to deliver much more experience and tooling around it to help you um, in building images uh, on the Kubernetes platform regardless of what platform you're on. Um, to show you examples of how the API looks like also, so you, the, the, in, the, in this slide you can see two build objects on the left side. It's a build that uses build packs, uh, cloud native build packs. On the right hand side you can see the same uh, application is being built by source to image. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, WShip builds will consume these, uh, these build definitions and produce the image for you using the appropriate build strategy that is chosen. Behind the scene, WShip build is powered by Tecton. So we are using Tecton as, as the engine that runs these builds using those build strategies that are defined. The next area I want to talk about is OpenShift Pipelines. OpenShift Pipelines is a cloud-native CI-CD framework uh, based on Tecton. It brings Tecton Pipelines on OpenShift. Uh, in other words, uh, it provides a Kubernetes-native declarative API, a series of standard custom resources to define your pipeline. And more importantly, it runs, it's native to Kubernetes, it runs as isolated containers. So every pipeline runs as a series of on the containers that are on demand uh, are scheduled when your pipeline executes. The advantage of that is that you're, uh, first of all, you don't have any central CI-CD server to manage. Uh, it's, it's a capability of the platform. You only have your pipelines and when you want them to run, they run in containers. You don't have that central thing to manage and govern and have a central team to nurture and upgrade and take care of that. Uh, and the second thing is that since your pipelines are completely isolated from each other, you can, you have full control as developer teams, you have full control over these delivery pipelines, what kind of plugins you want in them, uh, what kind of activities should happen in them. If you want to upgrade the JDK version that is used within your pipeline, it does not affect anyone else or anyone else pipeline. If you want to use a certain plugin, same aspect. These are for some of the issues that a lot of our customers have run into and they're using a more centralized or traditional um, CI CD uh, servers that, uh, that are in use. Uh, Tecton is standard, right? So with your pipelines that are created using Tecton custom resources, you can run them on any Kubernetes platform. And in OpenShift, we, we strive as a part of which pipeline to provide a, a really good developer experience for using Tecton pipelines, including uh, visualization within the developer console and interacting with pipelines right there. Uh, the CLI to allow you to interact with pipeline through the command line tool, but also bringing it into the IDEs and VS Code um, editor. Uh, and uh, you shouldn't have to leave where you edit your code as a developer, you write your code within the same, same environment, you should be able to interact with this, uh, with these technologies. Uh, you can see a couple of screenshots on the slide of uh, uh, how uh, Take time is exposed with, with, through the various tooling that exists in OpenShift. Uh, you can see the diagram of the pipeline, the 
connection of that to the projects that you have deployed or application you have deployed and topology, the logs of the pipelines right within the console, uh, or uh, within the VS Code, you can get a visualization and code completion and help you author the pipelines. So we are working uh, very hard on adding more and more capabilities across all this tooling within VS Code and console and, and CLI to make it really simple, not only to interact with pipeline, but also create them and author them and bring a task ecosystem to, uh, to uh, auto-complete or visually edit or uh, create pipelines. So the next group of services I want to talk about are application services. Uh, application services on OpenShift are services that help developers create cloud native applications on a platform, taking advantage of these building blocks. Instead of creating everything from scratch, there's a large series of programming languages, databases, um, different type of middleware, and a lot of services from Red Hat Partners, more than 150 uh, services that are available as operators. So uh, you can consume these services when you're building an application. And a lot of their, since they're operator based, they behave like managed services. So you don't even have to manage operation of the services yourself. But just take a look at what, what services are available. So let's talk about languages and runtime that are available on the platform. Uh, a collection of programming languages, runtimes, and databases come uh, built in uh, in OpenShift. These are all like supported images that officially get shipped as a part of OpenShift. And if you have the application based on this prog uh, popular programming languages like Java, Node.js, Python, and so on, you can immediately, using those build technologies that I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, start building images of this application deploying deploy them on platform. There are also a series of databases that are delivered with the platform that uh, they, you can use them for within your um, development and testing environment to deploy uh, and uh, use them in your building application. At the same time, a series of runtime, obviously, like a HTTP server is quite popular for serving static content or PHP applications. There's Tomcat, Nginx, and Red Hat SSO, because uh, a lot of cloud native applications require a single sign-on when you want to uh, centralize security management across these microservices. So they're all shipped as a part of the platform, so you can start using them in their building application. And for applications that require more advanced type of middleware, like if you have traditional monolithic applications, Java Enterprise, that you want to move to containers, uh, or uh, you are creating, integrating your uh, microservices with backend services that are more traditional or uh, legacy application across the organization, or automating business processes or business rules, uh, Red Hat uh, middleware provides a very rich collection of uh, middleware based on uh, 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 JBoss technologies, uh, Open Liberty, and some of the cloud packs that come from IBM that you can use on the platform uh, and uh, enrich the application that you are uh, building. And beyond that, obviously, we have the partners, Red Hat partners that are building application and services for uh, OpenShift. Uh, they are, uh, a majority of them are exposed within the operator hub. When you go through operator hub in OpenShift, you would see a, a wide categorization of different types of services that enable DevOps or uh, data services or databases, security or CI/CD and so on that you can uh, deploy. And a lot of them, like I said, they run as operators, so they behave like managed services. You, you don't have to operationally take care of these application services and uh, use them within your application and deploy them on OpenShift. One of the other additions to the platform uh, is the application binding operator, which uh, allows you to connect partner applications, any application that is backed by an operator to your applications. Uh, so that credentials for whatever that operator is provisioning for you, being a database or a message queue or something else, can be automatically injected into your application uh, and consumed as environment variables or secrets or other ways. It is a similar model to how uh, open service broker function before a service catalog for people who are familiar with that uh, to make it available for operator services as well. Uh, the, the powerful thing about it is that it works based on labels. So if you keep uh, redeploying your application frequently, which is what you would do, especially if you're in a development environment or if you have a high velocity of deployment in production, uh, the labels would match deployment again and re-inject those credentials into the new deployment. So you wouldn't need to really do anything to get access to those operator-backed services. They would be available in a new, they need a new image or new container to deploy as well. 
under the hood, this is powered by Kubernetes uh, CRDs and it's easily integrated into your tools uh, like the rest of Kubernetes essentially, Kubernetes objects. Uh, and it works uh, across any Kubernetes object. So you can bind it to a pod or um, even uh, like a deployment or we're working even to make those credentials available just as a secret. So, they, so you, the platform doesn't have to dictate how you want to consume the credentials from these operator back services. You can consume it in any way you want, for example, in the CI CD flow possibly. The application binding operator is available today in the operator hub in OpenShift, so you can go through the admin console to operator hub and install and start using it. And the last category of services I'll talk about are developer services. Developer services are all focused on uh, the developer's day-to-day -day life. So there are a set of tools that help developers uh, be productive on the platform, but also uh, how to they package and deploy their application on, they can onboard their application. That says, uh, that starts with developer console, obviously, uh, the developer perspective uh, uh, within the OpenShift console that focuses on an application view rather than Kubernetes constructs. Uh, there is Helm for a uh, package and installing application. Uh, there is a developer focused CLI as well for fast uh, development iterations on your workstation. When you want to modify code, deploy it quickly within the container, and you want to skip building the image every time, and uh, which which is usually um, a headache when you have to do it like uh, every every minute or every couple of minutes have to do that uh, for hundreds of times a day. Uh, developer CLI uh, reduces that pain by making it uh, really iterative and uh, when you make it change, change in the code, it would just sync it inside a container and update the application. You can test the result of your change immediately. There are the uh, IDE plugins and Visual Studio code extensions that we uh, create around OpenShift and different technologies in OpenShift. Uh, so that developers can interact with the platform right within where they are coding. They don't have to leave the, the coding platform. Code the containers gives developers a local instance of OpenShift so they can run it on their own laptop. They don't have to be dependent if they're in an offline environment or maybe online, but they want to have full control, a single instance on their laptop. And there is code ready workspaces that gives a more collaborative Kubernetes uh, uh, Kubernetes native web-based IDE. So there's a rich set of developer tools and services that come with OpenShift to make the life uh, simpler for uh, for developers uh, on on OpenShift and Kubernetes and uh, make them more focused on the code rather than Kubernetes uh, aspects. Uh, and why do we work on this particular set of uh, tools? We look at the development process from an end-to-end -end perspective, really, from the whole development process of doing the code and debugging on your local environment, building and packaging it, and running the application. And when the developer is uh, comfortable with it, uh, commit that to the Git repository, run it through CI, CD, and deploy it to operating environment. So the, the series of tools that we, we provide and work on, we try to make sure that uh, Complexity of, complexities of interacting with OpenShift and Kubernetes are addressed uh, through each of these phases that developers and code go through and make life easier for them in, in their interactions with the platform. Um, I mentioned developer console to give you a little more in-depth view. So within the console, there are two perspectives. There is admin perspective that focuses on Kubernetes administrative uh, concepts, and there is developer perspective that focuses on end-to-end -end flows around applications. So you can see within the topology, for example, uh, visualizes how different components of your application are related to each other, how they map to Kubernetes objects if you even deploy uh, key native application or other type of applications, uh, even like visualize the traffic that is flowing uh, between them. So we, we work really iteratively hard on, on this piece of the product as well to, to address the needs of developer on Kubernetes uh, to, to make life really easy for them and do not force them into Kubernetes construct or um, uh, to, the, to the Kubernetes way of thinking if they don't uh, want to. Of course, parallel to this, there's admin console that it allows developers that want to be in a Kubernetes environment to interact with the platform more from Kubernetes perspective and the, the Kubernetes objects. Helm 3 is another addition to the platform uh, on uh, OpenShift that is uh, fully supported from OpenShift 4.4. It allows you to package, install, and update your applications on, um, on uh, OpenShift. 
Uh, it is uh, uh, widely used in a lot of customers, a lot of uh, teams already build Helm charts for deploying their applications. Um, it is um, Helm 3, one of the advantages that it has is that the Tiller component is gone, so you're on fully client uh, side model. There's a Helm CLI that uh, comes uh, with a platform. You can take any Helm chart, uh, provide values and configuration customization that you want to layer over a Helm chart and deploy it on the platform. It creates releases and the deployment of your, uh, your application. The good thing about a Helm chart uh, and Helm 3 is that uh, it follows uh, Kubernetes RBAC, right? So you, you have the same controls and security that you apply to the rest of your application. You can have it on, on, on a Helm and the charts that get uh, deployed on uh, within your namespaces. We also bring Helm uh, to the surface within the developer console so you can see uh, Helm charts within the developer catalog, developer catalog in the developer console is where you find content to deploy, different type of services, application services that we have been talking about. And once you deploy the chart, you will see uh, releases appear as a part of the in, in Helm um, uh, navigation item. You also see them exposed in topology. So you would be able to interact with Helm charts directly within the console, in addition to Helm CLI and other tooling that is available, of course, within the Helm ecosystem. Code Ready Workspaces, but like briefly mentioned, is a web-based developer workspace. So it, it runs on Kubernetes on OpenShift and gives you a complete stack of uh, what you need to, to start developing your application. You can create canned workspaces uh, that, uh, that provide a very familiar experience like VS Code. And once you click and create that workspace, it gives you all the tools that you have predefined uh, in a Git repo for what you, what you need for your application. You need a certain version of Maven to build your application, uh, or um, you need Java support, you need maybe a, a for Tomcat or EAP or some, some other application server on the side. So you define everything that you need uh, within that uh, stack or workspace and uh, put that in Git and any new developer that gets onboarded or maybe you work from different workstations or from home or work from different part of the organization or your team is distributed, they all have access to the exact identical stack that can create it within the browser and start developing. Uh, it is based on Eclipse Che and uh, it, uh, it gives you an additional space that complements your local workstation within your own laptop or, or desktop environment that you develop. What I would uh, like to finish with is a quick overview of a long list of capabilities that we have planned to uh, add to the platform uh, across platform services, application services, and developer services throughout this year toward the second half. There are many capabilities, I mean, won't have time to go through all of that, but uh, we, we are working hard uh, across all these teams to, to deliver the capabilities that our customers are asking so that it helps them to manage these workloads, uh, their workloads on the platform, build cloud native applications easier and be more productive when they are uh, doing that using these services. And with that, I'm going to wrap up the, today's session. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you.